You're going to ask me to say what, Norma, um, on two? Norma, yeah, you can go ahead. When people are just coming in, you can just say what you need yeah, to say. It's just a little ahead. bit more about um, how we started off and then towards the end, just a summary of where we're at. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Lovely to see you all. We just have everybody coming in. Over 100 participants tonight. I see some of you are out in the sunshine. Well for you. It's great. Um, and everybody is on mute. Which is brilliant, I think. So there's another 20 people coming in there. So just give us a second. Um, thank you for joining us on time. And we'll let everybody come in. Oh, Michael, good evening, all. Greetings from Malta. You're a gas man coming from Malta, log logging in every night. It's uh, lovely to see you again. And there's more people. Okay, so Alicia, I'm going to, or, and Audrey, I'm going to leave the. Um, waiting room to you now. We've got 100, over 150 people on. So good evening everybody. It's uh, lovely to have you with us and fair play to you for being with us on this absolutely gorgeous evening wherever you are. Um, I, I hope the weather is as good as it is here with us but uh, thank you very much for logging in and it's really lovely to have you with us this evening. So uh, well we're up to about 160. There's still people joining us so um, as they are I'm just going to start the presentation. We have a lot to get through this evening. So um, I'm eager that we start on time. And as always, we have our um, commitment to you that we will finish on time and that we will uh, have some interactivity and conversation. And hopefully you'll enjoy it. Thanks everybody for all the um, feedback that you've been giving us and the interactions in the chat box as well as in the um, in the feedback service. They've been really, really great and they're helping us to make sure that we provide you with the sort of content that uh, is worth an hour of your time on a Wednesday evening. So this evening we've got a topic which is um, very pertinent in the times that we're in with COVID and it's the challenges and surprises of um, in COVID of how COVID-19 has impacted on people who use drugs. So what's interesting for us as pharmacists is, you know, using medicines is Par for the course and we um, are used to, to dealing with people who are using prescription medicines but actually um, we also have to care for people who use drugs whether they have uh, are trying to stop using them or um, in needle exchange use them safely. So it's been a very great pleasure this evening to introduce uh, two colleagues and I'll do so in a moment but before I do I'll just go through very quickly the, um, the domestics of make sure that you have your microphone muted please Leave your video on if you can, because it's lovely to see people in between the, the presentations. But uh, if you're experiencing any problems with connectivity, turn it off. You shouldn't have any difficulty with sound. Just check your speaker isn't muted. Um, and if you continue to have a problem with sound, just logging off and logging on again tends to um, make that uh, manage. It, 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 it uh, does it. Sorry, I keep getting distracted by the, the box because there's so many people coming in. It's, um, so then uh, use the comments box as usual for any questions that you'd like to ask and we will be making the slides available and the recording available on the IIOP website and we may use some of the information from this webinar to share with stakeholders within the HSE. They're very interested to hear about the work the pharmacists are doing and to hear the feedback um, and for other jurisdictions, there's people in other countries who are very interested in the way the pharmacy community in Ireland have come together in such numbers every Wednesday evening um, as a community to, to consider different aspects of our profession. So just to let you know that is shared. As usual, we have the format and of this evening being a presentation and conversation with conversation interspersed. We can discuss things via the chat room um, and we'll be finished by nine, but we usually leave uh, the cameras on and our guests Stay with us for you know five or ten minutes if people want to remain with us for a little while to ask questions but we'll be finished by nine o'clock. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce our presenters this evening. Uh, Dr Eamon Keenan is the National Clinical Lead in the HSE Addiction Services. Um, he's a, cult, a consultant psychiatrist and we're very uh, honoured to have him here this evening to share his wisdom and, and uh, ex help us understand how he leads the national agenda. Uh, Norma Harnady is one of our own colleagues, the National Liaison Pharmacist in the HSE Addiction Services. And it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome both of them here this evening. 
we've worked with Norma in numerous capacities with some of our programs on needle exchange and addiction services, and we are absolutely thrilled to have her here again this evening. Now, spoiler alert, uh, I want to let you know uh, as we start that actually we're going to have this as part of a two-part series, uh, because when we spoke uh, yesterday, there was so much rich information that Eamon had to share with us in, with respect to the illicit drugs trade and the, the global implications of that. But actually, there's no way we'll be able to get through it all this evening. So what we're going to do this evening is Norma will um, present first, talking about addiction services, needle exchange, the impact on pharmacy services. And Eamon will, um, towards the end, help us to understand how the global drug trade is actually impacting on our streets and, and what it means for service users and, and for people who have been using drugs. Now we're going to do what we always do and find out who we have with us this evening. That will help our guests and it'll also just help us to understand who we're speaking to. So if you can just very briefly uh, indicate on the um, poll that has come up. So for people looking at the recording, you won't see anything, but what everybody else sees in real time is the poll coming up as people just let us know what their air, main area of practice are. So as we're answering the questions, there's about half of you have voted. So I'll just leave it another minute or two. Well, not a minute or two, I'll leave it another half a minute. Uh, because our feedback from you is we don't like to spend time at the beginning, uh, but it certainly helps us to know who we are. So we have about 65% of our community tonight. Um, you're very welcome. 9% of you are coming to us from hospital this evening. Um, our academic colleagues, 2%, well, there's two of you, and industry, five of you, you're welcome. Those in regulatory um, affairs, there's four of you, and administration, there's four. Uh, we have one non-pharmacist. I don't know if that's you, Eamon, who's voted, or if somebody else. I, I didn't vote. Maybe you didn't should, vote. Okay, yeah. so we have two non-pharmacists with us this evening. And for our uh, two fifth-year students, you're very, very welcome. And then others, um, I'm sorry we didn't have a category for you, but uh, we're delighted to have you here this evening. So you can see who's with us on the call this evening. And I'm sure if you flick through the screens, you'll see many familiar faces. So. We'll stop sharing those. And then um, the last thing I'll do before we hand over is just ask you about how you're feeling. This has become a bit of a thing with us, hasn't it? Uh, we do it at the start of every webinar. Um, and what we're seeing is a, a real trend in the sorts of feelings that are there. Uh, so for anybody who's not used to us doing this, if you can go to menti.com on your mobile device, on your uh, another tab on your screen and use that code, so 734831. 734831. And if you can just give us one word as to how you feel, and I will bring up the, uh, I'm going to stop sharing this, and I'm going to share my screen so that you can see how those feelings evolve. Now, we saw over the last couple of weeks that tiredness was a predominant feeling. Um, but let's see how everybody's feeling tonight. Now, just give me one second until I see where it is. Oh, here we are. Oh, wow. That's the first time tired hasn't been on it. Okay, you can't see that yet, but that's actually really exciting. Sorry. So I'll stop sharing that and I'll do a new share so that you can see my screen. This is exciting because this is actually the first time it's been different. Now, maybe it's good weather, uh, but can you see that okay? Yes, we can see it now. It's, it's quite small, but we can still. Oh, there it is. Relaxed. Well, hey, hopefully it's for good. Now, I, I did ask some colleagues during the week, I was saying, you know, the tiredness is, is still there in the centre, but there's some nicer feelings coming in um, of people being a little bit more in control. And she, she said, yeah, that does reflect how people seem to be feeling in practice. Now, only 50% of you, so about a quarter of you have voted so far. Um, so let's just be so optimistic. I'd love to take credit for that and say it was our, our webinar on optimism, uh, but I think that would be a bit too much to claim credit for that. Um, but where we share this is we share this with Philip Crowley and the Pharmacy Contingency Planning Group um, as we try to get as many indicators as we can as to how the profession are feeling and what sort of support we need to, um, to provide. But I must say this is looking far more positive than it has in any of the other uh, events that we've had. So great to see you feeling optimistic. 
relaxed, still a bit tired, uh, motivated. And we've arranged for um, another um, consultant psychologist to join us in two weeks time, which is Professor Abby Lane. Um, and she will be helping us to navigate some of these feelings and look at our mental health and explore how we can support that in this time of COVID. Okay, so 62 of you voted. I'm going to leave it there because we do want to get on to the, um, the, the evening. So what I'm going to do is hand over first to um, our colleague Norma Harnady. So Norma, you have control of the screen now. And uh, as I said, Norma is the um, National Liaison Pharmacist for Addiction Services and also the National Lead for Needle Exchange. We're really um, delighted to have you here this evening. Uh, Eamon and myself may be asking Norma some questions during her presentation or coming in. So Eamon, as I said, was the uh, lead, the national lead, uh, clinical lead for addiction services. Um, but I'll hand over to you, Norma. Thank you, Katrina. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us all in such a lovely evening. Really, we really appreciate that. Um, just to explain who I am, so I uh, look after uh, the addiction services outside of Dublin, Micklow and Kildare um, as a more or less supporting any of the uh, programs that the HSE run in terms of addiction and also look after the needle exchange program as well which is just in those areas. I did ask my colleagues Jim, Blaheen and Helen from Dublin for their input into this program so that we had a balanced and relevant uh, approach right across the country. So I thought I would start this evening by just reflecting on where we all are at um, as part of the general population. So this is uh, some research was done by the Central Statistics Office in April um, about how COVID-19 is affecting us. Um, so just to have, a, have a, a moment there to look at the main things that you can see. Um, what's captured there is that in general, the overall levels of satisfaction with life in general, um, personal relationships and feelings of loneliness um, and financial kind of negative impact as, as have been felt there because of COVID. And then some of the general uh, well-being um, indices are affected as well, except for perhaps exercise is up for some who I assume are those who are not employed anymore or have had to stop work. Um, and have more time and down for other of us, probably those of us who've had to work more or perhaps my children or that as well. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a different picture. Um, and I wanted to introduce this because this is what the normal general population feel like. And then the people who use drugs generally have a lower reserved cope with general life factors, excuse me, <clears throat> so we were conscious this as part of the, the services in developing our plan for COVID when we first started to start looking at this at the end of January, February. Um, and we started to, to look at the concerns we might have in terms of how people react to the different things that COVID might bring. So I'm going to map through how this uh, bared out and how some of those things we thought might happen did happen and how some have worked out better than expected and some of the changes that were made along the way. So by the end of this, you kind of understand why some of the changes come, have come along um, and how uh, some of the positive things that have come out of COVID, believe it or not. And Norma, can I, I noticed that you're saying there, um, you use the term people who use drugs. Is that the, the way in which we refer to the people who use drugs? You know, yeah, that's a doesn't it? It's, it's a very common, um, oft-discussed uh, subject, topic. Um, it's something that the people who use drugs would prefer to be used, that they don't see themselves as addicts or um, druggies. That's an aspect of their lives, but they themselves are people um, and persons behind uh, who have an addiction and who do use drugs. And people who use drugs use them at all uh, levels and different scales. We all use drugs more or less in terms of you start with coffee, move on to drink a wine or smoking or uh, the legitimate drugs um, that we use for relaxation um, and that. So that's the kind of all encompassing um, preferred term at the moment. So we prefer not to use addicts, junkies, druggies, any of those terms anymore. And who knows, maybe people who use drugs will become unacceptable in time. But this is what the, um, people who are uh, who are using would prefer to use at the moment okay so just then to um, go back to just why we 
what we looked at when we were planning ahead um, if people needed to go. Um, I just want the top of my slide is kind of cut off by uh, the Zoom panel. Can other people see the top there? We can see um, that okay, Norman. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. So uh, basically we considered if we had somebody who was using drugs, whether this was somebody who was on a treatment program, but used a little bit on the side um, on top or somebody who was never on a treatment program or just dropped out, um, how would we manage to keep them um, in isolation if they had to go into isolation? So they would be protected against, you know, for themselves and also protected against the general public. So the public health risk here and also the, the person themselves. So these are some of the factors that we had to look at and consider. Um, so this goes right from those who might be rough sleeping on the street to those who are living at home with family, um, but perhaps wouldn't have the same uh, uh, coping skills or um, access to, to other options. So this is what we went through. So the first kind of group of things to consider would, was drugs. Um, if you're you know, regularly using and you had to go into isolation, you wouldn't be able to source the drugs wouldn't be able to source the money to get the drugs and even with COVID a lot of shops and things were theft or shoplifting that would go on was uh, no longer available or even larger scale crime was no longer available um, or easily accessible because of the guard of presence. So the income was gone there for the drugs. Um, then there's the fear of withdrawals which would be kind of three different main withdrawal whether it be alcohol, benzodiazepines or, or opiate based. So that would be another uh, hindrance to going into isolation and staying there, which is, you know, with all the good intentions in the world, um, uh, if you feel absolutely horrendous, you will leave. So this was what the, the drug services understood um, was uh, something they had to consider. There also was a fear that people would stockpile drugs in case they had to go into isolation and stockpiling of drugs is never, never a good idea in terms of risk of overdose and risk of using them if they're there. Like having a back, packet of biscuits not being flippant, but it's the same principle. A packet of biscuits in the, in, in the press, it's hard to not think about them and dip into them a bit more and more and more as the week goes on. There's also the problem of limited access to clean injecting equipment that um, uh, needle exchange either in pharmacies or through the services. It was just that little bit harder to access. We had to consider how to, to bring that to the patients. I'm going to go through all how all of these uh, different factors were resolved and looked at um, either just after the slide or as we go through the presentation. Something also we had to consider is the five kilometer um, travel restriction really did impact on people either sourcing their drugs or sourcing uh, support uh, or agency help, whether that would be um, accessing counselling or accessing um, support from friends or things like that, or even just generally accessing their, their methadone or uh, their daily their pharmacy. So all of those things had to be considered as well. The next factor to consider was the environmental uh, environment, I suppose, that the patient's living in or being in. So even if you and I were asked to go into an isolation hub and planned that you'd have to go there for 14 days, take a while to consider what you needed for that time in terms of clothes, uh, hygiene, sanitary wear, everything like that, uh, entertainment. Um, so for somebody who's not terribly organized or haven't, hasn't had, no, I'm talking about a wide range of people, some would be fine, but others mightn't have the life skills to cope with that level of planning, might not even have the, the, the baggage to fit everything in or to consider how they're going to cope with that. Um, and the, that where you and I might have a family member that could drop things off, uh, help you out that way, others might not have. And the other thing to think about is that if somebody's infected, it's likely their family member uh, would probably be impacted as well. So we have to look at that too. Many patients uh, or clients or people who use drugs were uh, in unsuitable accommodation. For example, even those who are staying in homeless accommodation, there's up to three or four people in a room would be fairly common. Um, so that was not, not suitable for those who needed to reduce their contact with others. So that had to be looked at as well. Um, and I have to say, you know, that the response from the homeless uh, agencies has been absolutely amazing. And the response they've had from, you know, the, those that they need to support them, such as the council, has been uh, very positive as well. I might ask Eamon just to comment on that and, and the, the, the impact that that has had and the changes that have been made. Sure, I think um, 
as we entered into this whole uh, situation, uh, I think services were very anxious uh, about what would happen to, uh, well, you know, what we always have considered to be one of the most vulnerable groups in society. Uh, and I think from very early on, uh, services began to cooperate and work together, uh, both in the statutory and the non-statutory sector. And one of the big wins uh, for us, if you like, uh, was the work with the Dublin Regional Housing uh, Executive who were able to source beds for people uh, who were homeless uh, so that self-isolation and cocooning could occur. And partly that was because of what was happening in terms of uh, hotels were no longer having in tourists, uh, student accommodation might have been closed down. So a lot of accommodation became available and uh, we actually got access to over 670 beds uh, for homeless people in the Dublin region. So that was a real bonus uh, for us. Absolutely, and um, it is a big factor in terms of both mental health and homeless issues are, are a, a large, take up a large portion of our, our client group. Um, up to 50% of any clinic could be have some contact uh, with homelessness, whether supporting or on the verge of it, or actually in homelessness. So it's a very important factor. Um, so just to touch then on some pre-existing conditions, which is the third uh, back, you know, group of factors we had to consider, poor baseline help, particularly respiratory, uh, for two reasons, um, COVID is a respiratory based illness and um, the, the people who use drugs tend to have a, a, great, a higher baseline level of COPD and asthma than the, the general population, a lot more smoking um, and also the actual drugs they're using such as heroin and benzodiazepines do affect the respiratory system so uh, they can have a negative impact as well. Mental health is also another factor that the, the services were very concerned about. Uh, having to go into isolation is difficult for anybody, but for somebody who has mental health or who, who has uh, past trauma, and uh, as part of that trauma, some, some have developed strategies such as distraction, whether it's going out for a walk or meeting friends or having a particular routine to distract from thinking about past traumas, whether it was abuse, loss, grief, um, or just memories of, of bad things that have happened. So many have different ways to distract from that. And time alone is something that they would often try to avoid because uh, that can lead to drug use to try and get rid of those memories or stop them coming into their head. So that was something that the services were very worried about. Um, and then finally, just a kind of the, the ability to cope with nothing to do, um, sitting in, in a, a room in isolation where all of you know, a lot of us would have might have access to an iPad or something, but a lot of some clients um, didn't have access to phones even uh, so that's actually something one of the first things that that was kind of innovative in terms of the services that those who didn't have phones um, they did try and source phones for them so they could at least be contacted for consultations for appointments for just general support um, so it was a really uh, novel way um, new thing to, to give to clients and, and it worked very well so then I'm going to go through some of the changes um, and plans that went in place, you know, the concrete stuff that came out of the, the, the thought. The first thing that we looked at is the drugs, uh, which is interesting from a pharmacy point of view. Point of view that we, know, we knew we, the normal route to start uh, patients off is quite slow from an administrative point of view and also from just being very cautious and safe. So we had to kind of balance the safeness of starting somebody off against the, the, the safety of, of getting them started quick um, and not exposing to the risk of COVID. So uh, this was a multidisciplinary um, a plan that would involve, uh, you know, pharmacists, doctors, and and Dr. Eamon Keenan as well, um, and this is available on the N N National Social Inclusion website. So the main things that came out of this was that the, we had to seek people who were either homeless or on waiting lists or just out in the street and bring them in um, and get them started as soon as possible. And the aim is to, to get that done quickly. So the, one of the end results of this is that 500 new people have been started uh, since January 2020. That's a 5% increase um, on our, on our, it's gone from about 10,500 people in treatment to 11,000. Doesn't seem an awful lot, but when actually these are started, they started quickly, they're often um, the more difficult people to start and more complex issues in that. So uh, it, it's been really commendable that that has been done. And I'd also like to point out that this was also the time in the middle part of this graph here, uh, where the pharmacies um, were very busy. And they, um, uh, I'd like to just acknowledge and appreciate that you welcomed these new patients into the pharmacies. Um, 
I'd often took me a while to get through on the phone and the pharmacist is obviously under huge pressure and then was so accommodating to the new patients. I really, really appreciate that. And the patients do as well and the services do, so well done on that. Um, so then we had to work through just the induction and how we're going to get it through to start rapidly. So the main points is, um, sorry, there's actually, a, um, Alicia, a, a window stuck on my frame. It's, it's to do with somebody in the waiting room. I don't know if we can get rid of that. Oh, is it something to do with the waiting room? Yeah. Um, just I think it had disappeared. Are you able to move it across the screen? Okay, I'll try that, yeah. Okay, it's gone. While, while she's doing that, Eamon, you had uh, mentioned that uh, the response to community pharmacy is really helpful with the addiction services. I think it was unbelievable what was actually achieved. And I mean, Norma just highlighted a few figures there and 500 people and in the context of 11,500, you don't think uh that you know that's a huge amount but the reality uh, that we were dealing with is that these were people who had never been in touch with services before they had complex needs there are reasons why these people hadn't been in touch with services before uh, and the fact that uh, community pharmacies were able to take these people on board and care for these people in the middle of this crisis is, is really amazing so we had a huge response from the hsc addiction services from the ngo sector and then from the community pharmacies and without the response from the community pharmacies, we wouldn't have been able to move this volume of people into care and we would have been looking at a very different scenario now uh, looking back on the last two months. So I think, uh, you know, hats off to everybody who's been involved in taking on and, and caring for this population in such a sort of strange environment and in, with such, uh, uh, I, 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 it's hard to imagine, you know, seeing people who uh, are homeless, getting a room, uh, getting uh, an assessment and getting into treatment and going down and queuing up waiting uh, at the pharmacy for their methadone. Uh, we, I think this is something that we didn't realise could happen and it wouldn't have happened without the input from the community pharmacy. Yeah, it's, it's great to hear that and it's always good to hear it from uh, somebody outside the profession. Uh, Norma, I'm just thinking if you stop sharing and start sharing again, just to see if so that might uh, resolve the issue with the, the frame. But mm -hmm. Eamon, um, I think what's particularly uh, nice to hear um, for the pharmacy profession. And I'd encourage everybody who's on the call to hear this message because we often say people don't appreciate what we do. But actually, you know, this happened at a time when you were already really busy trying to mm. figure out how to deal with COVID and social distancing and how to manage when the, the phone, there was a 300% increase in your phone calls. So, you know, I think it says a lot about the profession and that the care that they have for, um, you know, patients in general and people who, who need their help. Uh, so I think a well done to the profession. Um, so thank Absolutely. you for that. Absolutely. That seems to have resolved that, Norma. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So just to go through, the rapid induction meant that the time frame, as Eamon said, you could have somebody turn up one day and almost be started the following day. If you had a previous history of the patient, they had track marks, you had them on before, you knew them, which is sometimes you know quite common um, that you'd have a sense of, what, of the person that they had been around before. Um, a virtual consultation platforms meant that um, the patient didn't have to, to commute in to see the GP. Now, this was done a little bit more cautiously and, and in, in fact, a lot of the time there was a preference to try and get some kind of uh, the patient in for at least one uh, urine sample to make sure they were in need of, of methadone or uh, suboxone, as, as I'll discuss in a minute. Um, and then the other two major factors that speeded things up is because the post, at the same time as we needed it, the post started to slow down. Um, so we couldn't rely on that for either prescriptions or for uh, central treatment list cards in the pharmacy. So health mail came in there and it was really, really helpful timing. Um, now, one of the things we had to consider then is this, the, the choice of medication um, at the time. Just stuck a bit. So the choice is either uh, methadone or buprenorphine, and I just want to quickly outline that usually methadone is the most common thing that's used. People are used to it, um, and GPs are used to how it works and that. that has, that's the main uh, positives with methadone. However, uh, it's a difficult one to start. It's a difficult one for rapid induction. Um, it's, a, it's hard to get up to the, the optimum dose quickly. It's less safe if takeaways are required. and uh, it's less safe in, in, in polydrug use is there because it is at a high level of respiratory depression, complex pharmacokinetics, um, and a, a kind of a delayed 
onset of action in terms of take a dose today, the, the, you know, the impact of that might not really you forget about that. It'll also be there, felt there about two to three days later. So that makes it complicated if patients aren't being supervised daily. Buprenorphine is, is, is less common used and uh, people are getting more familiar with it though it can be tritated up very quickly uh, in a matter of a few days to an optimum dose but a patient does have to be in withdrawals and has to stop using say for, her for example for heroin that morning but it means they can be inducted and feel quite comfortable within a couple of days and are more likely to stay in an isolation hub or get started quickly and, and be held well so what's actually happened, we just wondered which way that would go. And this was all done in uh, consultation with um, experienced level two GPs um, that uh, would know which choice to, so would suit the patient and the patient would have obvious input into it as well. So the outcome is there's about a 30% increase in buprenorphine initiations over the three months. So that's a big change for us. The other thing we had to look into was uh, an additional layer of safety is the patients were getting uh, newly started, titrating up doses, maybe still using, uh, not getting maybe quite as much support as they normally would in a clinic or being seen as often as they would in the first week or two. Uh, though virtual consultations, outreach consultation, counsellor consultation, all by phone, um, were given as much as possible. Um, so naloxone um, was given, offered where it could be. Um, so this is a medicine for those who don't who are not familiar with it. It's a take-home medicine for self for lay person administration for a person who's gone into an opiate overdose. So um, it can reverse the effects of an opiate overdose in a, a matter of minutes. Um, but one of the problems I'm just going to raise it here. Uh, I'm sure it's been on your minds as well. Is uh, the fact this is used along with uh, CPR. Um, this is an intramuscular preparation. There's also an intranasal prepara preparation, but intranasal in the time of COVID, the two of them don't match very well. So, um, sorry, I just mentioned here as well that as much naloxone was prescribed in the first three months of this year, uh, of, the, of those three months, February, March, April, as was the whole of 2019. So there really was a massive push to get COVID out, uh, naloxone out there into the community. Um, but well, very, that's, good, very well that's good news, Norma. It's also uh, the fact that we've used our budget for naloxone, so I have to try and find to get some money from somewhere else for the rest of the year for naloxone. It's such a positive thing. I'm sure you'll, you'll manage <laughs> to do that. Um, the other positive thing that has come out of this is, is just the, um, the, the, over, the actual prescribing naloxone is only one part of it. Uh, along with it goes a whole load of education pieces about uh, uh, overdose response prevention and what to do in an overdose so that has a massive impact too and the actual amount of overdose usage we think it hasn't been used that it has to be reported and sent back in by those who used it so it's, it can be a little hard to capture but there doesn't am i right in saying name and nothing has come back in um, we, we've had uh, uh as far as we can know, and, we, and we're having meetings every week with all the managers around the country, the use of naloxone has been much lower uh, during this time period than, say, for example, last year. Obviously, we'll get the statistics later in the year, but uh, we're not hearing about a lot of opioid overdoses. We're hearing about other overdoses, maybe polysubstance use overdoses, and I think we're going to talk about those a little later. Uh, but uh, the opioid overdose I think there is such an awareness amongst uh, all of the people who are working uh, with the cohort uh, that there's been a big concentration on getting the naloxone out. And this slide uh, was developed in conjunction with ISHCA, which is the service user representative group, and they've been really active working with us in, in all of this. Yes, and just two points to point out in this slide. It's available on drugs.ie. Um, uh, there, the, the PPE required, gloves, face mask, apron and protective eyewear before you start doing um, PPE um, and sec sorry, start doing CPR. And then the bottom half of this poster, because it's quite long, it just highlights there is no recovery bets. You just do chest compressions and that's that's all. Yeah. So the issue of CPR is going to not go away. Um, and the Department of Education, sorry, of Health have uh, put forward something that you should all maybe take the time to read through um, in a quieter moment about if you were faced with CPR, a CPR situation, how much would you put yourself at risk? How much would you have to consider? And it's a good idea, I think, to have at least thought about some of these things before. It might be different doing CPR on your on somebody in your in your own home and environment that you know their background. Um, but if it's somebody on the street and you know don't know their background, 
that throws up a lot and you don't have any equipment with you or you do that throws up different um, kind of things to think about so that's on the department of health uh, uh, website and um, can I just ask Norma, I know I don't want to confuse people, actually that thing is coming up on your screen again, so you might have to stop sharing and start sharing, but while you do, um, naloxone is, uh, administration is a service available through pharmacies and something that you do um, training on with the IAOP. Um, and pharmacists, I, I know that there there's some queries about the... Um, about the availability of that training just because of social distancing and that so they need to be uh, navigated but if people want to or have more of an interest after this evening we might ask people to uh, convey their details to us and perhaps we pass those on if you want to organize training Norma um, mm -hmm. I know it's something that you already do with some pharmacists uh, and pharmacies around the country yeah we could certainly look at it we'd have to tease some of the things through because some of the, um, the CPR videos have uh, mouth to mouth and that so we'll have to work all that out but we will we we'll work on that and work through some virtual training and a question coming in is, is has there been any reports of increased thrombotic events secondary to COVID-19 in this patient population I don't know if that's something that you can answer now maybe it's not uh, or uh... yeah no th that that's that's interesting because um, it has been highlighted that those uh, leaving hospital in general um, should carry a, an, a, 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 a be given a card about increased risk of VTE post hospital discharge, and it's something that I raised with the local clinics that our client group are probably at a higher risk of a DVT anyway. With many of them have very damaged veins or have a past history of DVTs, so apparently there is some evidence that those leaving because of COVID have an also an extra layer of risk. So. I don't know about the actual uh, combination in, and the evidence in our patient group because the overall uh, amount of people admitted in our patient group has been so low that you couldn't make any, you know, statistical. Well, isn't that, uh, isn't that, that a good news story? That's a very good news story. Yeah, Absolutely. I don't know if you're going to be telling us about that later, but Eamon, you've just commented that that's not been reported as such. It hasn't been something which is coming through on, on our uh, weekly teleconferences. Um, but again, as Norman says, we've had a very low incidence of COVID uh, amongst our population. Is that a spoiler alert, Norma? Have I just ruined the, okay. the surprise? Sorry. Right, right. <laughs> Quite all right. I'll stay quiet now. Go ahead. That's OK. Um, so just coming back towards the plan and, and how we continued on from there. Um, so just in terms of thinking about people who had to go into isolation, uh, and supporting them and uh, just to, to let you know about the level of, of multi-agency approach that was used here so in terms of homeless uh, section the council response were responsible for the actual building or structure and this varied but you know whatever had a wall in it whether it was in um, some kind of prefab structure or a hotel or that the council had responsibility for that end of it and then the actual social care food linen um beds you know all of those that angle um some of the non-governmental agencies uh, like Simon, Peter McRae, Barry Trust uh, had input into that um, and they, in many cases it was them who actually ran and, and had staff on site to you know, be there 24 hours to, to support those in the hubs. These hubs were for people who use drugs um, specifically because um, it wasn't deemed to be a good mix to put them in the general pop population. So, uh, and then the third angle was the medical and nursing care was usually provided by the local addiction service. So they'd also call on some of the public health and uh, nursing and social inclusion nurses if they're available because it, it did, did at times require 14 days round the clock care, as in maybe twice daily checks to do observations um, and temperature checks and that to make sure they weren't you know, destabilizing of that. So there was a, there was a lot of um, input there from, from different angles. Um, from a uh, pharmacy perspective, uh, I suppose I had a concern that there was, you know, methadone and different drugs being put into a non-medical set setting. So I just had a look at how that would be managed. And this is a very sim simple guideline that's available under the COVID uh, clinical guidance uh, page. Um, really, you probably wouldn't notice it very much, except that the carer who was coming to pick in the pick come and pick up the patient's methadone in the pharmacy um, you might wonder what's happening to the medication when it got back to the, the hub so this is really a plan around that 
um, and it's a safekeeping part, uh, guideline really because the people in, in the hub um, managing it and running it are generally non-clinical staff so their role is really to make sure it gets to the patient and the patient self-administers but that they would only get the appropriate dose for that day so they wouldn't get the whole week at the one time or it wouldn't go to the wrong patient and that. And if there was a nurse who was available to pick up or drop off or to, to administer, administer uh, this, the methadone while they were doing their observations and they felt qualified to do that, then that was done that way. Now, to be quite honest, the volumes that have been going into the hubs um, in my particular area have been low and the uh, those running the hubs in Dublin um, are very experienced um, you know, like Simon, Dublin Simon, Safety Net doctors and that, they'd be very experienced at working with the home, its whole cohort. So it seems to have gone very smoothly. So just to really think as well about how we, uh, we did think about how the, the pharmacy, how we could reduce the impact of our patient group on pharmacies. Um, the patients were briefed and not going in. If there was any symptoms, we had to educate them on the symptoms, educate our first, our first ourselves on the symptoms, um, and they did kind of change a little bit towards the beginning. Um, it also took a little while for the, the, it to drive home um, the social distancing. And I think that was could be true for most of us. At the beginning, to begin with, we weren't taking it that seriously. Um, and after a couple of weeks, we realized this is serious and begin to, to knuckle down a bit. So we've asked um, if anybody is experiencing, still experiences issues in terms of social distancing with clients to, to, to contact us, to contact the services. We certainly work through with them. If somebody had to go into isolation, we'd arranged home delivery, a home delivery service for them. Um, this was drawn up in conjunction with the PSI guidance on just general uh, deliveries, um, whether it be through, uh, through health services or volunteers. Um, but the, uh, these, these are amended by each clinic um, to adapt it for OSTs deliveries. Um, it, the clinic would usually phone ahead, they'd ask if the methadone could be ready. I'm going to use methadone because it's easier than saying methadone, suboxone, subutex. It's just any of those medication. Um, if they could methadone could be ready, say around 10 o'clock, and that if they were spotted in the queue, that they could be asked to, you know, to come forward and, and, and let the nurse in and pick up the medication to go. And pharmacists have been amazing um, in terms of supporting that, giving the nod, come on in, let's, let's get you out of here rather than having to wait. Um, and then the pharmacist would deliver it to the patient. And there was protocols around that. Um, not every time a nurse was available, because it was every day, um, in most of the cases they'd have to do delivery. And some clinic staff would know their client group really, really, really well and know when they're intoxicated and not well enough to consume their doses. And they weren't uh, obliged to, to supervise the patient, but some did, because they knew them so well and they, they knew what was appropriate. Um, there's a photo taken of the handover so that it's proof that it was done. And if the patient wasn't at home, which did happen occasionally, which is kind of um, hard not to be cross at, considering you've gone to the effort to drop in the stuff off, but it did happen very rarely now in Barris, um, or the patient wasn't in a fit if stayed to consume, they had to return it back to the pharmacy. And the Gardaí have been very, um, in, in local areas where required, been very helpful uh, in assisting if we needed a driver to accompany maybe one nurse dropping off. Um, and in some areas you would need to get the escort as well, particularly if it was a regular daily routine thing um, that you're dropping off methadone to a particular point. Um, so one of the other things we considered is try to reduce the football in the pharmacy. And we asked the GPs through the ICGP, could they consider dropping the level of supervision required? And this poses some challenges, the supervision itself in terms of maintaining privacy in the pharmacy um, and also the social distancing requirements. So a balanced approach is now needed for uh, supervision at this point, especially as this looks like it might continue like this for quite a long time. So too, too much, uh, too little supervision will end up that there is the risk of the patient destabilize. Um, are some patients who would even report back to the clinic, not necessarily in COVID, but in general to say they prefer more supervision, that they're getting intimidated to sell their takeaway doses, and this could be very difficult for them to manage. Um, but too much supervision means more time in the pharmacy. 
so we may need to look at some, some something more long term. Now, the interesting thing that has come out of this is that in general, patients had done okay without daily supervision. Um, perhaps maybe I'm not, I've no, nothing to, to, to back this up, but for maybe 80% are doing fine, 20% could do it more supervision perhaps. So we just need to find out what that is. Um, patients in general, the isolation has suited them more than we've uh, expected. Um, perhaps it's because they're not on the street and street life can be difficult, trying to avoid those who want to sell drugs, trying to avoid the Gardaí, trying to avoid those who they owe money to trying to those that avoid those that they have passed grievances with. So staying at home sometimes seems to be um, an easier option. And Eamon has actually advocated for just a general lockdown for all uh, all patients who use drugs. That would yeah, be our guys, for. our guys are doing much better uh, in this than, than we thought. So we're all happy, you know, with the lockdown. We'll just continue it. No, but but seriously, we have been very surprised at how well it has worked out. And we just want to maybe look and see is there a balance to be struck with this? Um, so just to go through again, as, uh, a little bit about um, the legal changes that took place um, um, but to do with health mail and really the, main, the, the only major difference that came through here there's, is to do with uh, controlled drugs is that the prescriptions can get to the pharmacy in a different way and all the other legal obligations must be adhered to. Uh, the pharmacist, pharmacist prints off the scanned script that comes through by health mail and they don't need a paper copy sent in the post or anything like that. And then you, once you've finished dispensing the script and writing on it and all endorsing what dose has been given, that is photocopied and sent off the PCRS for, for claiming. And faxes are specifically noted in the guidance as not being legal. And there's no need for them if, if health mail is available. So just to recap, so the main thing to think about if the changes to do with health mail is that the scripts can arrive into the pharmacy in three different ways now, scanned, uh, handed in by the patient or sent by post, and they leave the pharmacy in a different way in that they leave it as a photocopy of the original um, sent to the PCRS. So they're the two main changes there. And the other change then is the emergency supply uh, regulations changed. So at the request of the prescriber, this is the first time there's been uh, a five day supply allowed under a controlled drugs, for controlled drugs under the emergency supply provisions. So the pharmacist can request five days, sorry, the, at the request of the prescriber, the patient can request five days, can supply, sorry, the pharmacist can supply five days, but the GP has to furnish a prescription within 72 hours. And then this second point about the uh, patient's request, I think it really is a nod of recognition towards the responsibility that the pharmacist has in terms of deciding if the patient is fit to get a supply the experience that they have and also the knowledge that they have of the patient. No pharmacist was going to make a judgment to hand out a supply of, of, of methadone to a patient they've never laid eyes on before. But if they know Johnny has been coming into the pharmacy for five years, day in, day out, and, and has no, you know, they know that five days is going to be fine, that's a good judgment call. Um, and five days can be supplied and a, a prescription does not to be, need to be followed up with them. Now, Norma, in the interest of time, um, I know you were going to discuss with us the hospital setting. Now, we've uh, six colleagues on from hospital, but I wonder if you go to the surprises and we go to Eamon so that we can hear, uh, because the majority of the colleagues tonight are on community, and then actually we can, we can spend the last five or ten minutes uh, after the call, specifically just coming back to the hospital situation, but we can also make these available to people. Would that be okay with you? Yeah. Perfect, yes. Perfect. Um, so then just the, surprises, uh, weren't there? yes, and I just, just to take one, 30 seconds, just a pharmacy needle exchange, uh, the difference between two months of last year and two months of this year is that there's about somewhere between 20 and 60%, don't talk about 60% difference of people coming in. And I think the main factors are the, the distance, uh, five kilometer distance, the travel thing, um, and people, the barriers of, of privacy coming into the pharmacy. So the surprises were da, 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 is that there were less than 20 positive cases in our cohort in the whole country, which is really amazing considering the vulnerabilities that are there. There's a reduction in homelessness, um, which we'd hate to see it being reversed and very, very hard heading into the winter to see people being put back out on the street again. Reduction in overcrowding, even those in the homeless centres have been spread out. 
uh, reduction in rough sleepers, which is genuinely those who sleep on the street or in the cars, from about 100 every night in Dublin to 25. So that's a huge difference. Um, and then it's been, we've been really surprised uh, about the compliance with the isolation in the patient group. The waiting list time has gone down. And we're seeing new faces for, you know, the clinic, the waiting list of 30 people. That's cleared within two weeks, it's back up to 30 people. People are coming forward because they, they know the waiting list is down and also because um, possibly to do with the lack of drug supply. And this is going to lead it in quite nicely into Eamon's uh, presentation about supply. And thank you all for listening. So Eamon Absolutely. will go through this slide at the end as well, so we can leave that. For Thank you now. very much, Nora. I think that's uh, been really helpful to people who are particularly uh, working with this patient group, and they may have seen uh, a lot of this happen over the over the time that over the last number of weeks. So Eamon, if you can share your slide, um, what we're going to do now is move over to consultant psychiatrist and the clinical national clinical lead for addiction services. And Eamon, um, when he, we we went through some of this content yesterday, he actually had a lot more content to share um, and we made the call because we've had feedback before it's frustrating when you have really good content and we cut it short so they we made the call that we we're going to do a part two uh, with Eamon next week um, and actually where he goes into a lot of detail around the global illicit drug market what happens when you have something like COVID interrupting supply and what happens is the, the, the manifestation of that in the street. So I think, Eamon, um, I'll pass over to you. We'll probably have to focus mainly on the COVID restrictions this week, but you might give us a taste of the type of things we'll be talking about next week as well, because I think uh, people will be very interested in that. Okay, um, thanks Katrina. I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna try and give a, a whistle stop tour of uh, what's been happening in the global drug market. And this will start, save you having to watch uh, Narcos uh, box set. So uh, for the changes in the, the drug market, uh, I think you have to uh, know uh, what exactly uh, the drug market was. Uh, and our global drug market is now uh, linked and it's digitally enabled. It's, there's been big changes in, in the drug market over the last while, and there's been a significant involvement of organized criminal gangs. So before we talk about the impact of COVID, you just have to know a little bit about this, and I'm not going to go on too much, but I can talk more next week about all the different ways you can smuggle. Yeah, um, and it's actually, it's been really interesting as pharmacists listening to Eamon yesterday, we're so used to its legitimate supplies and quality assurance to know that this is equally massive market of medicines or drugs uh, moving around. I think uh, this is an area, Eamon, we, we, we definitely want to hear about next week as well. But yeah, uh, okay. looking at it here is great. So the organized criminal gangs are becoming, there's much more violence and corruption associated with the, with the drug market now. And we have within Ireland, one of the big organized criminal gangs in the world uh, who've been involved in moving drugs uh, to Southeast Asia and down to Australia, New Zealand. What we are seeing are the drugs are becoming cheaper and, and more potent. And from the point of view of drugs in Europe, we import cocaine from South America and heroin from Afghanistan. Our cannabis is, is sourced locally. Uh, 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 or in North Africa and Europe, we are actually the, a global supplier of MDMA, which is often produced in the Netherlands. So in terms of the global drug market and, and for Europe, uh, it's a 30 billion euro industry. 39% um, of that is cannabis at, at 11.6 uh, billion, 31% uh, cocaine at 9.1 billion and 25% is heroin. So, that sort of gives you an idea that cannabis is the main uh, drug in the global drug market. And uh, we're seeing that about within the last year, 25 million people have, between the ages of 15 and 64 had used cannabis. Uh, and then with heroin, we have about 1.3 high risk uh, heroin users. So uh, young people and cocaine is, is a big issue. Uh, we have uh, 2.6 million uh, people under the age of uh, 34 used in cocaine in Europe. So how, does all the, how do all these drugs get around the world? Uh, and there's various different ways. If we look at heroin, uh, we see that the main way heroin is transported is via land, uh, with less by air and a small number by sea. But if we look at cocaine, we see that there's a lot of maritime uh, transportation of 44% of cocaine is uh, transported by sea. And just to put, let you know a little bit about that, why, do, why can't we intercept more drugs? Um, well, every year there's about 750 million containers or 20 foot equivalent units uh, transported by sea and only about only less than 2% of them are screened. 
coming into Europe, the two big uh, ports uh, where drugs uh, are sourced through is uh, Rotterdam and Antwerp. Uh, and again, why can't we target these uh, ports? Well, if you take Antwerp in 2017, there was 3.5 million shipping containers passed through that port and only 1% of them uh, were inspected. So the going rate at the minute in uh, the port of Antwerp for uh, a corrupt uh, port official is that you can earn between 75,000 and 125,000 euro to facilitate each drug shipment. So that's per drug shipment, a corrupt uh, drug official or a corrupt uh, port official will be able to get that amount of money. So it's big business. For the cartels to talk to somebody who works in the Antwerp porting uh, without having to uh, commit to doing anything illegal, they get 5,000 euro per conversation. So it's big business. Looking at air transportation, as we said, a lot of the uh, cocaine is, is made in South America and then transported to, to Europe via air in various different ways. Now, it doesn't come on the Aer Lingus flight uh, in, in uh, our, our uh, commercial airlines, but it's in business jets. And there's various different ways uh, that people do on schedule drop-offs, uh, their light aircraft. Uh, and what's happening in Europe is there's a huge number of uh, small airfields or small airports where corruption uh, can happen and where drugs can be uh, dropped off and sometimes the planes don't even land they throw them out uh, as they're passing over. Coming in from North uh, Africa helicopters can carry 900 kilograms of cannabis uh, per journey and, and drop that off. And there's also drones and unmanned aircraft so there's uh, that's been uh, growing. Uh, postal delivery we, we're all getting used to, in, in the current situation to getting everything delivered to us by the door, and that's no difference from drugs. Uh, so the postal delivery has expanded rapidly in recent years, uh, and uh, there's a huge volume involved in this. And, and just to take it into context, the Vienna Mail Centre handles 4 million postal items every day. So uh, it shows you how drugs can uh, come through the system because of the sheer volume. Uh, we post a lot of MDMA from the Netherlands, uh, for the United States and Asia, and there were 100 kilograms seized of MDMA from the Netherlands in 2017. In the Far East, in China, uh, new psychoactive substances and the new benzodiazepines are being uh, manufactured in illicit factories and, and, and produced and, and sent over here. And indeed, you can get online uh, drug purchases through social media, the dark net, everybody's heard about the dark net, but you can also get it on the surface net. And this is uh, a surface net. Uh, website where you can order your MDMA or Molly as they call it. Uh, you can choose the, the price, uh, the strength that you want, and then subsequently you can post uh, how happy you were with the product that was delivered uh, to your door with the delivery service and with the uh, particular uh, effects of the, of the product. So it's all changing and it, 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 it's what's been going forward. Heroin comes from Afghanistan and the main way it comes is by road through the Balkan route. And as you see this slide, uh, the main uh, route is up through Turkey and the Balkans. There's a, another route, it's called the Southern Route, that goes around Africa uh, by ship. Uh, and that, uh, just be remember that, but the main place it's coming through is the Balkan Route through Turkey. So what's happened then in, in COVID? Well, it's obviously been huge changes. Drug traffic in Bayer has been completely disrupted. The, the, you know, if we see an airplane uh, flying in the sky, now we're, we turn and look at it. You know, it, it's so unusual to see it. So. Air, air transportation has been disrupted. Road transportation of heroin via the Balkan route, that's been hugely reduced because borders have been closed, uh, travel restrictions have been put in place, and it means that law enforcement are looking at people who are driving and say, what are you doing here? So all that legal camouflage for uh, people who were transporting heroin uh, has uh, disappeared, and so they're much more uh, at risk of being picked up by the police. And that's why the southern route around Africa, the maritime route for heroin has now increased. Um, but it's led to sort of shortages in relation to heroin in, in some parts of Europe. Um, when you produce cocaine in, in South America, you need gasoline. Colombia doesn't have gasoline and it imports gasoline from Venezuela, but the borders are now closed. So cocaine production has been interfered with. Um, also the production of heroin uh, in terms of uh, acetic anhydride, which is a precursor, has, that's got a legitimate use, but there's no legitimate trade going on. So that's, that's decreased. 
simple things that you wouldn't think about. The opiate harvest in Afghanistan is between March and June, uh, and they're reliant on migrant workers, but the border has been closed, so the migrant workers aren't able to go in to harvest the poppy seed. So the opium harvest in Afghanistan is way down, and, and nobody really knows what's happening. But the, 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 the illicit factories in Southeast Asia are still going, so synthetic opioids, synthetic benzodiazepines, or the new benzodiazepines are uh, being produced. Uh, Cannabis hasn't been affected as much because that's often local uh, production and, and, and uh, distribution. But we have seen maritime uh, transport of heroin and cocaine noted. And again, the internet access and mail delivery has increased. So for ourselves in Ireland, what has this meant? Well, it means that the cannabis has continued to be available. Uh, but remember the, what I said earlier in relation to the potency, and that's really increased. We've seen new benzodiazepines, and we've seen a number of overdoses associated with these new or novel benzodiazepines. There's been disruption of heroin in terms of access, and maybe that's one of the reasons why more people have enrolled in OST. Uh, before COVID, every time you picked up a paper, you were reading all about cocaine in rural pubs in Ireland, and cocaine and uh, a packet of crisps were as easily obtainable in every rural pub in Ireland. All the pubs are shut, so the weekend cocaine market has disappeared. And now there's more cocaine available uh, on the streets. People may be stockpiling drugs because uh, you know nobody is buying drugs, nobody can get out to buy drugs, they can't transport drugs around as easily. Um, and there's also been a significant number of seizures during the lockdown period. As we're coming out of lockdown now, there's a big worry in relation to drug parties, people getting together, sharing uh, drugs, taking drugs, and the risk of overdose is high. And the other big risk that we're facing is an economic downturn uh, which may lead to increased heroin use. We've seen that previously in economic downturns. We saw that with the Celtic Tiger and more recently cocaine has increased. Uh, but the, you know, if that moves away back to uh, a recession, is heroin use going to increase? And then of course, our services get less money. We always seem to be the ones who lose out uh, when a, a recession happens. Just to say drug dealing is still going on. And uh, I just make a note of the guards have seized the 2.5 million worth of cocaine in one, in one seizure. And we've had the lurid headlines that we see uh, in, the, in the Herald there, pizza and Coke deliveries to the door, Garda intercepting people who were delivering pizza and finding out they also were delivering Coke and not the kind you drink. Uh, and then the other uh, note there is uh, from uh, drug dealers in uh, Cordoff, who uh, the breaking news they put out in social media was that cocaine kills coronavirus. So cocaine fixes everything. So. Uh, the, the drug dealers are adapting to the COVID situation. The new benzodiazepines I mentioned uh, are, are a big worry, and these were overdoses. And it just shows this, these two, this slide shows you the types of lengths that they go to to produce a legitimate looking uh, packaging for uh, the, the benzodiazepines, which often contain alprazolam, but other things as well, adenazolam, etiz etizolam, and uh, fluolprazolam. This is an overdose awareness uh, poster that we've produced uh, and that we're hoping to circulate around all the community pharmacies and you have a big role to play. Uh, you're coming into contact with people uh, as we're coming out of lockdown. I've, I've said that the, the risk of overdose is, is high and I'd ask you all to put this uh, overdose, uh, drug overdose awareness uh, poster up uh, if possible and, and, and talk to people who are coming into your uh, pharmacy in relation to OST or young people as well and, the, and that's some of the things I'm going to talk about next week is the changing pattern of drug use amongst young people. So that was a quick whistle stop tour and I'm sorry for talking so quickly uh, I hope you could follow it uh, but I suppose within COVID uh, we've been concentrating on harm reduction uh, we've ensured that everybody who's been on OST has continued on OST both within the HSE clinics within community pharmacies there's been tremendous work done and I think we have to acknowledge that we've taken on a huge uh, group of new people we have um, developed specific guidelines which are available on the social inclusion website website and also on uh, drugs.ie and I'd, I'd encourage you all to to look at that information and uh, any questions we'd be happy to answer so that's me Katrina yeah oh sorry Katrina you're muted there Hi. So thank Hi. you very much, Eamon. That is, uh, I appreciate uh, that you've gone through a lot there. Um, and you spoke yesterday about, yes, it's great that we haven't had the, the 
um, the differences and, and we've seen a lot of OST, but actually we need to look at the benzodiazepine and the deaths that have happened have been yeah. there. So you really, um, Eamon will go through that for us next week and we'll be able to identify and help us understand more about the illicit drug use of what could be legitimate uh, medicines, but are being either used or, or sold uh, at counterfeit medicines. Um, I am looking here, I, I think for both Norma and Eamon, you'll agree that that has been an amazing insight into what has happened is in this sector. And as much as we've worked within community pharmacy really hard, it's obvious the amount of work and collaboration you have had to do as part of addiction services. And I think Kira says it best when she says huge achievements, well done to everyone involved. Well done isn't enough. They're amaz they are amazing achievements for such a vulnerable and complex group. And so my Thank thanks you. to both of you in your role and, and similar comments coming through on the chat room is, wow, you have really done a, a huge amount for this group. And um, similarly, I think to all the colleagues who are working in community pharmacy, a, a very big well done. And, and you know, we, we look after patients every day, but it's nice to just stop sometimes and recognize that we're making a difference, not only in the lives of people, but in the social um, demographics and how things are in our, in our country. So thank you both, um, and I am privileged, or uh, we're, we're privileged, privileged to um, have both of these speakers back next week because we knew there wasn't going to be the time for questions, but we knew that there was going to be interest in the area and a lot of questions coming through about the habits on the street and how that's changing. So um, we are going to get more opportunity to um, to, to look at that and somebody's just come in and said great to know that we live in a society first so they're lovely comments and I suppose if you ever need validation for uh, what you're doing you know uh, if it isn't validated enough by seeing the uh, real benefit to the, that population actually just hear from tonight that that's very much appreciated Thank so you. I think you'll agree there's lots more we could hear and we would like you to have your questions so We'll be inviting, and they very kindly agreed to give up next Wednesday night as well at eight o'clock. So we'll be inviting Eamon and Norma back and hearing a little bit more about the um, the drug habits that we may be um, we need to be aware of that are going on in our communities. So what I'll finally uh, end with is just to say thank you very much to everybody who's been here. Particular thanks to our speakers um, and to all of you. Um, you know, everybody was pretty much stayed I mean, we've had a couple of people drop off at the end but we're still at 150 people who are on the call and um, as always I am going to not lose my opportunity to encourage you to reflect on what you've heard today how it might impact on your practice what you might do differently in your practice uh, when you're thinking about this patient demographic group whether it's to put up a poster, whether it's to engage in conversations, whether it's to make contact with the addiction services, um, really do think about how it's going to impact on your practice. And finally, I'll leave you just with the advertisement for next week's uh, webinar at eight o'clock on June the or on June the third. Oh my gosh, can you believe it's June already? Uh, next Wednesday, we'll be listening to De Eamon will be um, giving us a lot more information. He will be going first next week about uh, a lot of the habits on the streets and Norma will be joining him as well to help us understand the implications for pharmacy. So I'm sure you join me all in saying a, a very big thank you to both of you. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you, Norma. And I look forward to seeing you next week and similarly look forward to seeing all of you, um, our colleagues, next week as well. So thanks for this evening and enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a good week until we see you next week. And anybody who wants to uh, stay behind, we'll um, ask Norma to just touch briefly on the hospital situation, because I think that is important. Um, and you can ask one or two questions as well. But for the rest of you, good evening and thanks for joining us. Lots of thank yous coming in there, guys. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, thank, you. So thank you. That was great. Norma, do you want to, I don't know if you, we need to bring up the slides, but do you want to just talk briefly about, but if you have the slides, that's fine as well. But do you want to talk briefly about the hospital situation just before we... Sure. And... Um, Look, anybody who's in and wants to leave, don't feel under pressure uh, to stay. It's very brief. It's really just to kind of highlight that um, two but things. As you're bringing that up, just to know, you see, I'm sure you see in the comments, they're saying it's a brilliant presentation, very insightful, really interested in part two. So lots of really positive comments there. Um, and somebody asking if we can be put in contact with you. So yes, anybody who wants to either contact Norma, we'll put a couple of questions into the feedback report so that you can give your details, ask for contact with Eamon and Norma, um, and we'll be uh, delighted to make more of a connection with the addiction services. So sorry, Norma, you have your slides up there. Yeah, just two main points. Um, 
just by, from a point of view, don't, just don't forget uh, about the fact that hydroxychloroquine, which I think, I did check this with a colleague, I think it has been used a little bit in the setting of, of acute COVID, COVID in hospitals, um, and but there is, it's coming out as of as little clinical benefit and is causing some trouble in terms of arrhythmias and QTC prolongation, which is something that also occurs with methadone, particularly doses over 100 mils a day. So just kind of to set off the alarm bells ringing if you have a patient coming in on methadone, that that could be, um, pose some problems, just to think about that. And secondly, then, if you have somebody come in um, on methadone, to this is just really an opportunity to highlight a document that we developed last year in response to uh, numerous reports and um, a kind of requests for help about how to manage the patient in hospital. So this is available on the Social Inclusion website. This is just one uh, extract from it. It's really an algorithm of what to do. If you have somebody who uses drugs, where do you start? How do you assess that they're on OST? Who do you contact? If they're not, where do you go with that? How do you titrate up? How do you discharge? Everything like that. So just that's the two main points I wanted to make here to highlight that um, very useful document. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and as I say, you can see there for yourself all of the comments. So many people saying thank you. Really looking forward to next week's lecture. Find that really interesting. Uh, so thank you for giving your time this evening. Um, okay. So we always leave the, uh, if you want to stop sharing your screen there now, Norma, we always just leave it on uh, for the last few minutes so people can see each other. People say that they like to feel part of a community and see their colleagues. Uh, in the middle of the week that a lot of people feel quite isolated and drained by uh, the fact that they're not able to see uh, their colleagues quite so much. So I suppose I'm not for a, a minute suggesting that we're the alternative to a night out, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're, we're providing some uh, level of connection across our colleagues. Um, are there any particular questions that people would like to ask while we have them with us or will we maybe actually to be respectful of your time Eamon and Norma what we'll do is we leave it there because we'll have you again next week and uh, we have hogged enough of your time what we will ask uh, people to do when they we send out the information is to maybe tell us what you want to hear more about what aspects of illicit drug use or street uh, drugs or even criminality I know Eamon at one stage you were saying everybody knows who's uh, leading the uh, drug gangs in, in Dublin I think I'm hiding under a stone. I, I, I don't really know very much. So certainly everything that you can kind of give us an insight into that world uh, for people on the call when we were speaking to uh, Eamon yesterday, it's so much in insights and, and Norma similarly, but Eamon has so many insights and he kept saying, I only know this now because uh, I work in the area. I don't, I'm not involved in drug <laughs> use. <laughs> he had so much info and intelligence on how you smuggle drugs in containers and where you put them and how you transfer them. That uh, it, it sounded very interesting. So I don't have the stomach for things like uh, Breaking Bad or Narcos or anything like that, but this is a way where you'll get an insight into that uh, environment and, and world without having to go through the, the violence of Netflix. Any last yeah. uh, comments from no, I, I just did, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not Walter White, but I can tell you these things, Katrina, but I'll have to shoot you afterwards. Yeah. Oh, right. I don't even know who Walter White is. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so I'll just declare that up front. I presume... Some... Breaking Bad protagonist. Yeah, so. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> this is what I mean. Uh, excellent presentation. There are bombs being used locally by youths where I work. Any information on those bombs in inverted commas? What are bombs? They could be the uh, nitrous uh, oxide uh, capsules. There's been a lot of talk about those over the last uh, few days. Uh, that, uh, you know, the little silver canisters of nitrous oxide that young people are taking them and obviously there's a risk associated with those. Uh, they take them to get giddy. It's laughing gas, uh, and uh, that may be uh, what what he's talking about. And obviously, there's information uh, up on various websites about the dangers and the hazards of that. Uh, mm. Okay, wow. Uh, you might give us a bit more information on that. Uh, God, this is a real education for me. I, I, I really don't know. I'm so green. Um, in terms of uh, somebody saying they're concerned about the general population becoming reliant on sleeping uh, 
AIDS. And actually that's something that I know for sure that we will be talking about with uh, Professor Abby Lane, but also that might be something that you can help us understand more about next week as well. Um, advice on safeguarding patients who are getting into dependency, because I can appreciate with levels of anxiety, people are, um, are probably finding uh, it difficult to get sleep. And Geraldine wants to get enough information uh, and intelligence from you to uh, write a bestseller next week. So, <laughs> right, okay, on that okay. taster note, I would say thank you both for a fabulous presentation. Thank you to the IOP team, to Audrey and to Alicia. They've been working beavering away in the background, letting people in and sorting out issues with sound. Um, and let's say we meet again here next week at 8 o'clock and look forward to seeing both yourself Amy, and Norma. Okay. okay, thank you. Have a lovely evening, everybody, and thank you for thank your you company. Thank you all. Take Thanks. care. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye.